is. There Here he is. is, Scott Stokely, joining us for the first time on Tour Life. It's about time, Scott. Second we appreciate time. it. This is the second time? Yes. Yeah, go check your most viewed podcast ever. And you'll, well. People were five. saying it was the first, the second time. And I was like, I went back and checked. Was it last no. year? No, I think, yeah, I was, I was definitely on last year. I think I was talking about um, my take on island holes That's after right. the European championships. Gosh, dang it. We might have to do it again because you made another post this year saying how uh, you like the changes of hole 16. Yeah, uh, did I make? I did not make a post about. I did not say that I no, like the changes. No, I think I think you said some stuff. I think you said some stuff potentially. No, I didn't well, comment because I wasn't there to play. No, I, <laughs> I, I did not. And, and again, I this is all just philosophical. Like I have my my general opinions, but I I still can always concede that the course designer dictates the course I play, not me. So that's fair enough. But we can always have takes that the course designer doesn't know what they're doing. that is always a fair take but how's it going like uh give us a little breakdown because your story the last you know couple years have been very fascinating you know me and you kind of when i was getting on tour you were kind of having this resurgence of getting you know healthy getting in shape wanting to come out and compete with the young guns and and honestly doing a pretty good job uh at doing that at several tournaments and then the past year, I want to say, you were like just traveling all over the world, playing in all these crazy exotic locations all over the world. So, kind of give us a little breakdown of like these last couple of years, how it's been, um, and, and you know, being a part of the Scott Stokely adventure. <laughs> it's honestly, it's it's a whirlwind. I mean, it's a dream come true. Uh, I I've estimated that I've slept on more than a thousand couches. Wow, uh, over the years. Um, in traveling because, you know, bread, baloney, and sleeping on people's couches was part of being a professional disc golfer for many years. Um, you know, everyone that played in the old days paid our dues. And it's uh, it's honestly pretty incredible getting to, getting to enjoy, but still being just at the fringe of being young enough to get to enjoy the fruits of our labors. Well, you know, so I mean, getting the tough. tour in 2022 is fantastic, but, but, uh, Going to spend, I went to Australia, New Zealand. Went to, actually, I went to 36 countries Jeez. Um, in the last two years. Wait, I do you, do you got like the double Asia. passports I now? did the Euro Tour last year. I finished either sixth or eighth on the Euro Tour, but I shot 1,028 for the summer. I had two fifths and a third place finish at DGPT events. And they, they all of a sudden, they said, hey, you get a tour card for 2024. And I went, Oh, okay. I wasn't like, I mean, not that I didn't have expectations of playing well, but I'm also realistic. And then when I realized I had a tour card, I was like, holy cow, I can come play again. Not as a sponsor exemption, not as uh, someone who brings media attention, but, but as an athlete who earned his, his, his entry on the course by beating enough players to deserve to be there. And I was like, yeah, there's, there's no way I'm not going to take this opportunity to, to, uh, to take advantage of that. So I'm not young, but I'm still young enough. <laughs> oh, nice. Can we hear Yuli? Yuli, talk with Tess real quick. Me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It just has this stupid thing on my uh, screen says that I'm muted. So I was, I was, get, I was like, Yo, you got to, you know, size is a shysty, shysty guy back yeah. there. You never know what he's doing back there. Okay. Um, what, what's the passport looking like now? Like, are, do you have to get, you got a double passport now because it's so many stamps? No, my passport, no. Um, because all the European countries was basically Shenzhen, right? You get to all go to all the European countries in one. Um, so that was most of them. Gotcha. Um, in fact, the biggest problem with Europe was that, that, um, that it was a 90 day visa. It's 90 days out of every 180. So I actually had to ditch out to Romania, Bosnia, and Serbia for a little while just to free up time to come back. Oh my God. To do some stuff at the end. Um, but honestly, the biggest thing, I, I got my tour card, uh, but I didn't know what my plans were. I mean, I wanted to come back, but I still was uncertain. But I had been trying to create a disc company for several years and, mm. and uh, Stokely Discs. 
uh, we originally, we had bought chain discs a few years ago, and all of a sudden, something happened in the world where we couldn't get plastic. Um, I don't want to get you demonetized, so let's just say I don't recall what happened, but we couldn't get plastic. So we had, we owned chain and couldn't get plastic, but I had an investor. And so even though we had been building this business plan for several years, ultimately I'm ready for someone else, waiting for someone else to write the check, which means who knows? I mean, those things fall through more often than they happen. And so towards the end of the season in Europe, I got the phone call that said, hey, just so you know, um, we've ordered the machines, we've ordered the molds, the warehouse is being built, this, we got a production facility being created, this is happening. And I went, oh, so this is, this is real. This is like a dream. Uh, it's the holy grail of where you for a disc golfer. And I was like, do you think I should come back to America? And he's like, yeah, I think you kind of need to be here to promote your disc line. Um, but it doesn't mean I was going to go out and try to compete on the pro tour had I not earned my card. I could have mm -hmm. gone and done other tournaments, promotions, clinics. I, I, there's a lot of different paths. But once I had my card, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely doing the tour because I belong. You know, I yeah. certainly belong. Where, uh, you know, you've been all around the world playing disc golf. Where are some of the places that you would say like, hey, this is a place that we need to be keeping our eye on as like maybe a, a place that future champions can be coming out? You know, clearly we're seeing that um, with Finland. Well, oh, we're oh, seeing that Estonia. Yeah, let, let me just leave Scandinavia and the Nordic countries yeah, out because that's just such an obvious answer. Um, here, here's what I noticed because, you know, I... First, I played my first round of disc golf in 1976 on the world's first course when there was only one course in the entire world. So I've literally watched the timeline of disc golf for almost 50 years. And everywhere I go in the world, basically every country I go to is somewhere along that timeline. Mm. So New Zealand is disc golf in the 90s. Australia is disc golf in the early 90s. Uh, the, the UK is disc golf in the 80s. Uh, but uh, there's other countries where it's disc golf in 1977, where they have one course. So like, like every place is just on a different place of that timeline, but everyone's timeline is doing this. Like no country is like, oh, we used to have seven courses. Now we have three. Like that, that story doesn't exist in the world. Everywhere is growing. But when you have one course and you have to explain to every single person in your city, what is disc golf? It's hard to get course number two, but if you're in Finland and you have 900 courses, pretty easy to get course 901. So they're all growing, but they're they're facing this different challenges. Um, I, but honestly, I would say uh, the, probably the hidden gem right now, and I, I'm looking forward to going there this year. I my gut tells me the Philippines. The Philippines oh. had some people over there that are doing some really hard work from from love. And look, there's a, there's a person over there who's traveling around the country or has been on a bus with a bag full of golf discs and a portable basket going from school to school, introducing disc golf around the country, wow. not getting paid. Uh, she has a sponsor that covers bus fare and meals. So she was wow. crashing at people's houses. All she's doing is teaching people about disc golf and disc golf courses have slowly been popping up behind her. Oh, that's it's an amazing awesome. story. That is um, incredible. And I, I, so I would say I'm going to go ahead and say Philippines. They've got honestly like a pretty good um, history of ultimate Frisbee too. Like they, from, from what I've gathered, like they love ultimate Frisbee there as well. And you know, Throwing a frisbee, whether you're playing ultimate or you're playing disc golf, it's it's the same kind of love of the flight of the disc. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that is one thing that would really start escalating the disc golf pro tour a lot. Is you know you see what it has done with having like a champion like Kristen and having her country kind of behind mm -hmm. her. We've seen what it does when we have great players from Finland. I think we start seeing other great players from around the world. I think all of a sudden it brings a lot of more eyeballs to the sport. You know, it brings a lot more eyeballs instead of just having all the great players be here in the United States. You know, when, when I left, when I went to Estonia for the first time, like mind blown, 
We, we get on a ferry in Helsinki, we get off in uh, Tallinn in Estonia, and right as we're leaving the, uh, you know, the customs area and everything uh, for the ferry, there's a billboard, regular size billboard. It says, welcome to Estonia, home of Kristen Tatar. That's wild. And I went, yeah, that's, that's real. Um, hey, by the way, so to your point, by the way, just to go back, um, Colombia. Oh, Med Medellin, Colombia. They, they've held two freestyle world championships. They're huge on disc sports. Disc golf just being one of their disc sports. But um, in South America, it's it's Colombia. I think it's nine or ten courses now. But they're running PDJ tournaments. But they have an active disc community as well. And our plan is to go into Colombia in December to uh, go see what they're doing down there. I'm going to teach a bunch of classes in in Bogota, Medellin, and one other city. Yeah, Medellin has uh, some of the top women's players in the world in ultimate frisbee. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean that that would be. I mean, I would I would just love to see it. You know, like different cultures getting in and playing. I think I think it just adds it just adds to it. Um, you see it in like literally every other sport, and so uh, you know I think we're obviously far far behind in the development. Um, compared to other sports, but you know, eventually I think we'll get there. Like you said, from great works of these people that are going around to schools, to schools and teaching disc golf, doing what you're doing, doing what a bunch of other charities are doing, where they're putting courses into these places, giving people the opportunity of getting to learn uh, what disc golf really is. Uh, it's, it's great to see. For sure. No, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing and it's happening everywhere. It's just a matter of, it's not a matter of if, like this golf's here to stay. You know, we didn't know this was going to happen. Like in the eighties, we all thought this was going to be in the Olympics next year. We all thought this was going to be the next big thing, but we weren't sure that this golf would exist in five years. We thought it would, but, but now it's like, okay, we're here to stay. It's a question of how big we get, but not a question of if we're going to be yeah. a global sport that's, that's around forever. So it's a lot of security in that, at least, at least in my mind, uh, it's not going away. Yeah, it's 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 definitely as like stabilized, I would say, um, over these last couple of years. Um, it may, it might have has gone down a little bit just because that that COVID boom was kind of wild. Uh, but I think we're in a pretty stable spot right now, so it's it's, it's nice to see. Well, I, I tell you what, according to the stats, because there was such a jump during COVID, of course it plateaued a little bit. But attrition, like how many players stick around to the sport, that's pretty standard. Whether they started during COVID or 10 years ago, a certain percentage of people like it, a certain percentage of people keep playing it. So that's fairly predictable. There was such a boom during COVID that even now, as it, it has de declined a tiny bit, um, it, if it keeps declining at this rate, it'll be 2028 before it declines to the point we would have gotten to had COVID not existed. Oh, interesting. So we are so far ahead of the curve that like we're way ahead of where we would have been. So the decline is, is more reflective of it's not as boomy like it used to be. It's still fine for sure. Yeah. Do you have uh, you have any early stories of Yuli over here? Any, any, any stories, maybe the first, do you remember the first time that you and him kind of cross paths on tour or anything like that? Um, I, I'll tell you the, the, the funny, and I, it's a long story. I won't rehash. It's a story of a practical joke. I played on germ, um, where he was frantically call, calling Yuli and going, you know, like what's going on. So Yuli reaches out to me and says, dude, what's going on? Germ's freaking out. And I, I told him exactly what we did to Jeremy. And I said, you're not going to tell him, will you? And, and, and Yuli's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really know Yuli that well, but I knew, I knew well enough to know that he, this is 10 years ago. He, he got to take a shot at big germ and he's like, I'm good with that. <laughs> Always good so, for a good. So when I started joke. playing Stokely had, had left for a while. So he had like a absent in the sport during the time that I kind of came up and then oh, gotcha. towards the end, end of like, what was it? When did you come back? 2000 the end of 14. Yep. So 2014, right around there, Scott started coming back in. So we didn't, we had a big stretch of where I had, uh, kind of started touring everywhere. Um, but everywhere I went, there was always legends of Scott Stokely and there has been, so he's, even though he was gone, he's been around. Yeah, I've always been told that you were the one that basically got the forehand. You got people to start throwing the forehand on tour. 
Yeah, so here, the short of it is, like, I clearly didn't invent it. Uh, players like Victor Malafronte and, and Ken Westerfield, they invented the sidearm, or they didn't even invent it. The Healy brothers back in the late 50s were reportedly throwing it on record. But, but I would say they were the first two players that you would say mastered it. They were experts at that throw. But it kind of fell out of favor, and it was really something where there were, back in the old days, there were some, you know, there were some dominant, like dominant sidearm throwers or backhand throwers. And at a very early age, I mean, like when I was a teenager, I was like, that's absurd. Like, why would you not spin the disc both directions? You're throwing the harder shot 50% of the time. Um, Joe Racino, my first coach, had something to do with that. Uh, and I'm sure I got this from others. I don't think I came up with it on my own at like 13 years old, but I put it together and I was just a 50, 50 player early on. And I couldn't understand why anybody else wouldn't be. It just didn't make sense. And so when I toured um, in, in the nineties, if you look at any tournament video from the nineties, you, you'll see one player throwing sidearm period, at least off a tee pad. Mm. And I started doing throwing clinics and I went to 220 cities in the nineties to do throwing clinics. And I told every single person as part of my pitch at my clinics, the only reason you can get away with not having a sidearm is because no one else here has a sidearm either. At some point when everybody has a sidearm, you will be at a competitive disadvantage without one. You have to have this throw. And I did this. Uh, that was towards the end of the nineties. I took off for 13 years. When I came back, sidearm was part of the game. Now, I certainly don't take all the credit, but there's no doubt, I, you know, as far as what I've given to the sport athletically, I would say that's something that I take a lot of pride in that, you know, I, I contributed to that. Uh, clearly, the sport would have figured it out without my existence at some point, but it would have been later. Hmm. So, yeah, I, it was a big thing. I said, what are you guys doing? This is crazy. I'm throwing cider. I'm throwing hyzers on every single hole. <laughs> what are you thinking? It was obvious to me. When I came into the sport, there was still like a untold um, rule that sidearm was like not cool. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And I remember yeah, for sure. Like, like equivalent old, to like a cart? No, it just what like I remember <laughs> a couple of the really good players and I won't name who they were, but they would say they said this out loud at clinics that I heard sidearm isn't that important. No world champion has ever thrown a sidearm. Interesting. And I, I, it was like a, almost like a, oh, you throw sidearm Ugh, type thing, <laughs> which was so weird. And then, yeah, now, now look, you, you can, you cannot go on tour and be successful really across all facets, unless you have some sort of scrambly sidearm that works at least a little bit. We have great players like Isaac Robinson and yeah. Ezra who World have it in there. They don't really hands. use it or James Conrad, but you're not going to see that in 10 years. I don't think. Yeah, no. And, and it's, it's a testament to how good some players are with their shots when they yeah. throw the harder shot. You know, I've told people this when I do clinics, and, and, and this isn't me bragging. I know exactly how good I am, how good I'm not. I know exactly where I stand. I'm very objective. And I will tell people at 54 years old, there are holes that I will throw better with a sidearm than any player in the world can throw backhand. Because the mathematics of a disc fading the direction you want it to go, especially mm -hmm. on a sharper turn, you cannot make a backhand do that. You can't physically make a backhand do every throw a sidearm can, and, and of course, vice versa. So I will gain strokes on a pure backhand player, no matter who they are. Now, if they out me, out finesse me, out approach me, you know, they beat me in the tournament, but I was better than them on those holes. That shouldn't happen. That should never. No fifty-four-year-old should be better than the best in the world at anything. Well, so, it, it, yeah, it's it's just a it's a loss if you don't have it. And eventually, you'll have to. There won't be players without both. There's no so, doubt. So back in the when you were competing at your at your peak, you know, like you took how many second place at the World Championships? Uh, twice. Twice, and then how many final nines? Because that's what we call them back then. Yeah, oh, I, I was. I finished top five for five, no, six years in a row. Wow, six years in a row. So, yeah. uh, and were all those Ken Climos wins, or or did a couple other yeah. people sneak? Yeah, it was always Ken. Ken. It was always Kenny. <laughs> what do you think the closest you ever came, and what what held you back back then? 
or was it just Ken Climo just won everything? Well, okay. So the, the short answer is, and and I um, I, I always like to quote Charles Barkley because Charles Barkley's daughter once asked him, "How can you how can you never beat Michael Jordan?" And Charles <laughs> Barkley said, "Because he was better than me." <laughs> right. It's a it's a simple answer. Like there's no, you know, he was better than all of us. Um, nobody could compete with him. Um, Ken. Ken outputted me. Ken out finessed me. Ken had a better backhand short game than me. Um, I had a better long game than Ken, and clearly I, I had a sidearm, right? Um, but I could not make up the strokes I lost in those other areas. Like my estimate has always been, because you got to remember back then the courses were. I was gonna say there the wasn't a whole lot on. of drives. Yeah. It was yeah. approach and putt, and and I say approach and putt because. I could throw a approach disc on or a putter on nearly every course at, at a world championships. Now I threw farther than everybody else, but that doesn't mean they were actually driving holes. It means other players didn't throw as far as they needed to, or they, they, they could have thrown. Mm. So it was approach and putt, And that was the weakest part of my game. I was just never good at that. Well, I can't say I was never good. I finished second, but I always felt like that was my weakest part. So I felt like in a typical tournament is that I would lose a couple strokes to Ken putting. I would lose a couple strokes to Ken on my, (laughs) on my backhand finesse game. And then I would gain two or three strokes on the sidearm holes, but the two or three strokes was never enough to offset the four or five strokes. I lost over here. Like if I played a course, it was 18 backhand short, 250 foot backhand Heiser holes. I lose to Ken by five strokes around he'd never miss those holes. But fortunately, there would be one or two long holes I'd make a stroke, and there'd be some sidearm holes I'd make a couple strokes. But, so do you, you know, do you, he was better than us. That was it. So I do mean, you think, uh, obviously, course design has has changed drastically from that. Do you like your chances, obviously, better if you could have, you know, either pick, like, pretty much picked up courses that we play on tour now and drop them back in that era? And you guys now play like, do you feel like you would be on a, a more of a fair playing field playing on courses that we play today back then? Uh, so, to be honest, I mean, I, I think I would have, it would, I, I would be playing a different game than everybody else. I mean, I threw backhands a hundred or 150 feet farther than everybody. Or so you'd have a hundred feet advantage. farther than everybody. I threw sidearms 150 feet farther than everybody on those types of courses. Like I, 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 I would be playing a different game than them. It would, it would be like, like think about a player that only throws 375 feet going out and playing Eureka. Yeah. Like it doesn't mean they can't win out there. Doesn't mean that person couldn't begin to burn a given get day. We're still talking about the game of golf, but the competitive advantage of being able to, you know, have a 300 foot approach shot on a par four instead of a 400 foot approach shot every single time it, it adds up. You probably now, the, would have the, advanced the, the game quite is, a bit. The question is, though, is does a player from back in the old days adapt their game yeah. for the modern game? Yeah. So I could say the way a player like, say, Ken Climb or, or Ron Russell, I could say their game didn't translate to the modern courses the way mine did. But that does not mean that they wouldn't have figured out how to play that, that game. This is what champions do. It's kind of the old argument, which is like, well, could Hoyt Gracie – compete in the UFC today. Well, the reality is Hoyce Gracie in 1993 probably doesn't even make the the UFC roster today. But a champion like Hoyce Gracie probably would have developed a game and probably would be competitive today because he would be playing a different game than he did back then. And this is all, this is what this is the fun of sports, right? Oh, it's people all love theory, talking about it. Yeah. I suspect they would have evolved their game differently. But so then based on you, my game and the old players' games, I think I, I'm playing a different game. Who's your GOAT? Because <laughs> you've seen them all. Who's your GOAT? Who's the, who's the greatest player of all time? And Ken Climo is the most accomplished player of all time. There's no question. Who's the greatest of but, all time? But... I think it would be an insult to our sport to think the game has not evolved. You know, I, I, I don't think that any player playing of my generation is doing the courses what Gannon Burr is doing the courses today. 
and that is not that is not me crapping on me or any of the players from my generation. I'm saying the game evolved. Like, of course they're playing better. Can you imagine if the players today, you have a pool of players 15 times as large, you're drawing from real athletes. I mean, not that there weren't real athletes, but you're drawing from far more. You're drawing from people that are going single A baseball or the pro tour. I think I'll play disc golf. You have YouTube videos teaching people how to play. You have players starting at an early age. Back in my day, they, they wouldn't let kids go to disc golf courses because they didn't want them hanging out with disc golfers. <laughs> you put all those things together, it would be bizarre if the players today weren't superior to the yeah. players of my generation. So of you, think, you think that Gannon Burr is the most skilled player you've ever seen? I, I, I would say that he would have to, he has to do more to step past Paul yeah. for sure. I think I. I mean, I. I. I am mesmerized when I watch Paul Macbeth play today. Um, you know, winning a shorter tournament is more difficult than winning a longer tournament, right? It's called regression to the mean. The, the larger sample size you have, the more likely you are to end up where you're supposed to end up. I mean, I led a World Championships after four rounds in 1997 in in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Okay, could I beat Ken Climo after nine and a half rounds? Clearly not. Um, could I beat Ken Climo in one round? All the time. Two rounds, not as often, but frequently. Four rounds, once in a while, but very rarely. Nine rounds, never. <laughs> so for a player to win world championships that are four or five rounds, it's absurd. But again, that doesn't mean Paul's better than Ken. If Ken played at a different time. If Ken played today, I mean, Ken probably learns a sidearm. <laughs> If he started today and maybe Ken has the best sidearm in the world. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. How could you? What, uh, what were you guys doing back during those times? Were you guys having other jobs on the side? Were you got like, we just got off with Joey buckets who just won this past yeah. week. And I basically was like, Hey, if we, if we said that all the, tomorrow you have a million dollars, uh, contract, what would you change? And he was like, nothing he's like i would still stay in this rv i would still stay park in the parking lot at the tournament and i would just play disc golf all the time like were you guys able to do that back then were you able just to only think about disc golf and play disc golf and practice disc golf so i I wrote about this a lot and and this isn't just a plug but my autobiography scott stokely growing up disc golf i talk about this a lot um i was the basically the oops Hold on. I just, something just popped up on my screen. Oh, you're good. Um, the, um, I, I was the seventh player to go on tour. And the thing that I did differently was I monetized my tour. I carried merchandise. I set up at Tournament Central. I started running clinics. I started running doubles events. So I actually was fine. I made money during the week enough to be comfortable during the week. Now, comfortable doesn't mean staying at hotels. I wasn't sure. that comfortable, <laughs> but I could, I could sit down at a restaurant and order the thing that looked good. Um, I didn't have to like necessarily pool my money after a while, but I, we, we started off doing that. But a lot of the players, they were living like, you know, bread and bologna and they did, they had jobs in the off season. Now I, we, sorry, we all had jobs in the off season. Right. Obviously, I delivered pizzas in the off season, um, but I, I actually was the first person to do OK. Like I, I'm the first disc golfer to buy a house. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, I'm the first player when I got my deal with Discraft. It was the first real like the sponsorship deal. I was getting forty thousand dollars a year plus all the discs I could sell for, for free. So I actually made about one hundred thousand dollars a year uh, for several years. Oh, wow. Uh, playing disc golf. And now I was also managing the disc. I, well, I created the disc craft team that you guys are now members of. I, I, I created that. Oh, wow. Um, I managed it. Um, I did all the promotions. I did the advertising. I ran disc craft doubles events all over the country. So, I mean, this was not just playing disc golf. Sure. Um, but no, the players that were just playing disc golf, um, anybody not named me or Ken was it was rough. It was really, it was a labor of love. Yeah. Cause that, I think that's probably the biggest change that I've seen from a, a growing sport, something that just started into where it is now is like, you have now guys on tour that 
24 7 they're just thinking of how to get better at disc golf yes and like that's all they're focusing on and like you were saying like you guys all had normal jobs in the off season yeah yeah and you had some yeah. people probably that had a, a nine to five job monday through friday and then they you know drive however many hours to go to the tournament and they play a tournament on saturday sunday like that's that's yeah. it's just, it's oh, just a mean, different we, world we no i mean there were tournaments in the 90s where i would fly to a tournament where first place of the tournament was less than the cost of the airfare to get there. Nice. <laughs> Don't worry about food or right? anything. I mean, I you had I had to win a tournament just to not lose as much money. <laughs> um, but I, I feel the same way about about the business of disc golf then that I do now, which is prize money is a, a very small part part of being a professional athlete. Yeah. I mean, there was a year that Michael Phelps was the highest paid athlete in the world and he won $0 swimming. And I think he did $120 million in endorsements. I mean, I, I just obviously charity picked the most extreme example I could, sure. I could name, but you know, prize money is, is small. I mean, there's so many different ways. Um, and like, it's going to sound like I'm just tooting my own horn, but I'm, I'm just being straight. I created most of the ways that players make money, everything from traveling private lessons to, to, to video lessons, to running doubles events, or like the trilogy challenge. I basically, I not basically, I created that. I merchandised the tournaments. Um, I, I created all these ways of making money off my name and then my sponsors that, that I could make money off of to a point where prize money was like, eh, like on a good year, we made 10,000. Like I might make at the end of the year, I would make 8,000. Ken would make 12 or something like that. And then someone else would make five or six. And, yeah. and you know, that by the time you figure out your expenses, you, we were playing for free for yeah, sure. Breaking but, even. <laughs> but I made, but I made a pretty darn good living as a professional disc golfer. I just didn't make it in prize money. So you, you made, let's say you said a hundred thousand dollars for a few years. What yeah. happened? Did you leave the tour? Did you fall out of love with disc golf or was it just life? No. So I, there's so many rumors because my <laughs> right. I was I back know. problems. <laughs> I was burned out. Um, my daughter was born. Hmm. And so when my daughter was born, I, I, I wanted to be home to raise her. Um, I, my, my ex and I had split up, but we kept, we maintained a good relationship for many years. We co we co raised her. I just wanted to be home with my daughter and I, I couldn't be on tour. And this is the competitive part of me. Um, I didn't want to go to tournaments and, you know, finish sixth place and be patted on the back and being told how good I used to be like that. That's just not exciting to me. Like I never cared if I won. I, I honestly never once got upset when I lost as long as I was competing to win. Like I would seek tournaments out that Ken was out knowing damn well, he was probably going to beat me, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm competing to win. I didn't want to go to a tournament where I was like, I was like, Oh, I, I hope I make the final nine this, this weekend. That just doesn't, doesn't move me. So I just decided that if I wasn't going to be playing to win, I didn't want to play at all. And I just stopped dead didn't play again for like 13 years. Jeez, were you were you still like practicing, or you like literally just put the discs no. up for good? I got rid of I got rid of all my discs. Um, no, I didn't. When I stopped playing, I stopped. I completely dropped out of the sport. I stopped following it. The thing about when I when I tried to follow it, it would actually hurt me because when I I, I would want to be there. Well, first off. I didn't realize this till I stopped touring, but I had almost no friends in my hometown. All of my friends were my tour friends. And then all of a sudden I was like, do we lose them Silas? Oh my God. I don't have any friends anymore. And, um, that, you know, it was, uh, that was uh, kind of rough. So Silas? it actually hurt me to watch the tournaments. The, the U S open overall championships actually came to Fort Collins. I went out to the event to watch it and I left in, in tears it just, I, I saw my, all my friends playing DDC. They're out doing field events, the people I love the most in the world. And I literally turned around and got back into my car because I, I just couldn't, I was crying. I was like, I, I was so sad. I never even, I never even said hi to them. So I, I just, I, I couldn't like be in the world halfway. Now I did go to one tournament. My, my best friend said, uh, do you want to go to the Colorado state championships? We're going to dress like Sean, the sheep. 
And and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, we're going to, we're going to cover our faces with cotton balls and go play the Colorado State. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm definitely in for that. <laughs> um, but that was, that was just kind of having fun. But other than that, no, I didn't play at all. Wow. Where and then you... what happened to where you were like, okay, time to jump back in. So I, I'll share the story. It's a little bit longer story. Um, it, it is my favorite story in disc golf. So if you don't mind me sharing it. Um, yeah. So the, uh, I, I was I actually was, I was pretty successful for many years. I was running the internet businesses. I was creating businesses, selling businesses. I actually did quite well, but around 2011 or 12, the internet world kind of changed. Things got more difficult. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm like, my house is being foreclosed on. I'm not making money. My, my all my brilliant ideas turned out to be bad ideas. Um, we started going through a divorce and, and actually I, uh, I wound up deep in substance abuse. You know, I very innocently thought, Hey, if I don't have to sleep, I could get more work done and save my business. And that, and that quickly turns into, Oh, I want to do this because I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, so it wasn't a very long period in my life, but it was, it was a really dark period where I lost my house, went through a divorce. Just was, it was the worst. And at the time I felt like the biggest loser on planet earth. I mean, I lost my wife. I lost my home. I, my, my relationship with my daughter was incredibly strained. It, it was awful. So I happened to walk into fly green disc golf store. Um, Dave McCormick at gateway said, Hey, go talk. I, I reached out to Dave McCormick. He goes, we'll see if they, they want to carry my disc. Whatever. I walk into the store. It's a God's honest, true story. I walked in the door and the first thing I saw is a poster of me on the wall. Wow. Now you got to think about this. I'm, I'm standing at the front door of the store, the biggest loser on planet earth. And then I walk in the door, there's a poster of me autographed on the wall and two customers in the store, both recognize me. They run up to me. The guy behind the counter goes, dude, Scott Stokely. So he runs to the back of the store. And I hear him yell, Scott Stokely's in the store. No, seriously. <laughs> They all come out. One of the customers remembered a shot I threw at a tournament in 1995 that he witnessed. And he's <laughs> telling his buddy all about this shot over this building. And then I'm signing autographs. And my, I, my honest thought, I'll never forget, my honest thought was, don't they realize what a, what a piece of shit I am? Like, they, they, they don't even know that I'm a loser. Like, they want me to sign autographs. But at, at that moment, I didn't feel like a loser. I like, I felt like Scott Stokely. And then I, I realized that's the world I needed to be a part of. I needed something where I felt like somebody because I, it certainly wasn't working in the world I was in. So wow. I decided at that moment that I was going to get off the drugs and re-enter disc golf. And I walked out the door, the door of the store. And probably within an hour, I was buying drugs again because it, it doesn't work like that. But I, I had the idea in my head that, that, I could get out of the situation I was in, but I had to do it. I had to get back into disc golf. I, I needed that. And so um, I did get off. I did actually quit the drugs a little bit later, but I had nothing going for me. And every single day I wanted to get high just because that's the way it works. And, and I had nothing going for me. Like what's, what's making me not go back, fall into this. And I'm like, I got to get back out on tour. So I had no money. I had no discs except for some discs Fly Green gave me. I mean, I was rock bottom. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to call Barry Schultz. I hadn't talked to Barry in like 13 years. I called up Barry on the phone and I said, hey, Barry. And I basically talked to him for a little while. I told him exactly what I'd been doing. I told him about the drugs. I told him everything. And Barry said, I have a spare bedroom. Come live with me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I go, I said, I don't have any money. And he says, I'm not, I didn't ask you for money. Get to North Carolina, you have a home. And I said, well, how long can I stay? And his exact words were, as long as you need to. And him and his roommate, Brian McCree, who approved it, said, come live with me. I live on a disc golf course, a country course. He said, come live with us, won't, won't cost anything. And you can just practice every day and get ready to go back on tour and get your life back. Wow. And I uh, hopped on a bus, it was like a Greyhound bus, 2,000 miles, 1,500 miles out to North Carolina. No money, clothing on my back, a couple spare shirts probably, and some golf discs. And I showed up there and I started my life over eating ramen noodles 
sleep in Barry's spare bedroom. And uh, I started reaching out to tournament directors and I said, look, I want to play the tournament. There's my situation. And like Chuck Connolly, uh, you know, Spike Kaiser, uh, he says, he goes, hey, I run 40 tournaments around North Carolina. You can come to every single tournament I run. I'll pay your entry fee. You can keep all your prize money. Wow. And again, his exact words, he goes, would that help? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chuck, I, but that would help. And so basically what happened was the relationships I had built in the sport that I'm very proud of, the, the man I was, you know, before I started screwing up when I was away from the sport, the relationships I built were still there. The love was still there from the sport. And when I said, I'm coming back, the sport said, hallelujah, we think it's awesome. What can we do to help? And the sport took me back in, saved my life. The true story, not, not one word of that's Jeez. exaggerated. Wow. And uh, that's how it started. And then I went to tournaments and I ate more than bologna. I started off from, from scratch again, but that's, that's a, uh, yeah. And then that's why I'll never leave the sport again. I, I, I don't think I do well away from the sport. I need to be in the sport or else I don't, I don't succeed. Well, there's a lot of people out there that are happy that you're definitely back in the sport. You know, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it says a lot to have, you know, people follow you around and you, no matter where you go, you have a crowd of people that want to watch you play, want to get a photo of you, want to share a story. And that's the thing that I think sets you apart from a lot of people is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people that you just walk up and you just want to have their autograph and then they give you your autograph. You're like, thanks. And then you're bounce. Like your lines don't really move because you have people coming up that want to share something with you. They want to share a moment, a story. And to me, I think that's so powerful having that connection with people. Um, and so having someone like that on tour, like I saw it firsthand, I saw it firsthand of like you being at a tournament added so much value to that tournament. And so I know, I know everyone's very, very grateful that um, you were able to make that change in your life and, and come back to disc golf. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words and, you know, but it's very symbiotic. I mean, I give back, I, I try to give back more to the sport than anybody and as far as time and donations and class. I mean, all the stuff I do, but I do it for selfish reasons. I do it because of what the sport gives me. Mm. So for example, I, you know, I know you know this, but um, I've gone now to 288 cities to run a, a free disc golf class for kids and adults with special needs. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like I'm out there doing free classes. I, I cover my expenses. I, you know, a lot of them, I give them all discs. So it sounds like I'm this great guy who's like giving, giving, giving. But what you're not seeing is that the reason I started doing this was because when I came back to the sport, I had a lot of people say to me, oh, man, I really look up to how far you throw. Or I really look up to the fact that you played really well in 1997. But when I started teaching the special needs classes, I started getting a different response from people. People started saying, I look up to you as a man. I look up to you as a person and, and I admire you and I'm grateful to you. And um, I respect you, not for how well I throw a Frisbee, but for how I live my life. And for me, this, I mean, it's not as, as, I don't need it as much now, but in the early days of trying not to fall back into previous bad decisions in my life, having people tell me every single day that they looked up to me and they admired me, um, that kept me firmly on the side of, oh, I can't ever go back to this life. So is it, with everything I do to give back, I, I do it for selfish reasons. I do it because of, of what I get that allows me to be the human that I am, that, in, if that makes sense. No, it's a weird is. word selfish in this context, but it's, and it's, again, I give a lot in my selfishness, but I do it because of, of, of how it makes me feel. And, and it keeps me from screwing up basically. No, I mean, I think, I think we're all chasing. Keep, do to, it, keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think we're all chasing to be loved. I mean, you know, I think, I think that's something that social media has been a very interesting addition to society because it has allowed so many people to have an opinion or be able to like just quickly and easily bash someone 
that it is, I don't know, it's, it, it definitely seems like social media has torn us apart. I feel like when it first came out, it was awesome. And everyone was able to share stuff and people were like, this is cool, this is awesome, holy smokes, that's awesome. And now it's like been around so long, it almost seems like something needs to happen to like blow it all up for us to kind of go back to where we were because now it just seems like the negativity is the thing that kind of drives the conversation so much more, which is crazy. Cause like you were saying, like we all have felt that before. If you've never have never, if you've never felt like alone and wanting to feel a loved and whether it's like from your parents or from your spouse or from, we've all have felt that need. And I don't know. I feel like social media, sometimes people just like take it out, you know, like we're our worst enemy sometimes on social media. And it's, I don't know. I, I love hearing your story though, because a lot of people wouldn't say that. A lot of people would give a BS answer and beat around the bush and, you know, give you some sort of PR answer that someone fed them. But I think what you said is like real and in it and you know, people in the chat have been reading. Um a lot of people are 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 feeling what you're saying because it's real. It's real. Well, you know, it, it's actually it's funny because it it's turned out to be very good for my marketing, but it was not with that intention. You know, I, so when I wrote my autobiography, Growing Up Disc Golf, I, I, I had a, this was, this was my decision. I'm either going to be honest or I'm not gonna write the book at all. Cause mm -hmm. I'm not gonna write a book and talk about all my accomplishments and all, you know, I tried reading Brock Lesnar's autobiography and um, that's not what I'm gonna write. <laughs> um, I was going to be honest, but then that meant I was going to put myself out there and talk about all the, the areas I screwed up. And I, and I've just decided I was going to be a hundred percent honest about all my failings. And it turned out that I've just connected with so many people because I, I am successful. I am happy, but I've gone through shit, you know, and much of it I've done to myself. And I think everybody can relate to that, but I think a lot of people connect to the idea that, wait a second, I'm in shit right now, but I, I see that you got past it. Maybe this is something I could, I could do too, but I didn't, I didn't do it for that reason. But now that that's happening, I've connected with people on a way that is just different than like just a public figure. Um, it means a lot to me. Yeah. Cause honestly, you probably would be a lot more popular on social media if you only showed your highlights if you only showed your best moments if you constantly yeah. were trying to tell people how awesome you are and how cool you are and and on, unfortunately that's a lot of what social media is like if you've been around some of these people that have these massive followings that we all look to and be like i want to be like that i want to have that house i want to have that boat i want to have those vacations but then when you actually make meet these people in real life, like they're miserable, like they're not happy, but you would never know that from their social media. So a lot of us are like, we're chasing the wrong things. We're chasing something that has made this person miserable. And I don't know, I, I, to me, I love, I love how raw you are and how you're just willing to say it like it is um, without the worry of what people are going to think about you or the backlash or whatever it may be. Um, I think, I think there needs to be more people like that. There needs to be more people like that because at the end of the day, I think we're, we're, we're setting up, especially kids, we're setting it, setting them up for failure by trying to show them something that isn't real. Mm -hmm. You know, like we all struggle. There's all things in our lives that we're all struggling with. It's not all yeah. well, roses I, and candies. I have a page, one of my, my pages um, so I, I, I separate the disc golf world a little bit from the personal, but I have a page called uh, Scott Stokely's Longest Drive. Um, it's mostly Facebook, but that's where I talk about a lot of the non-disc golf stuff. And I, um, I even talked about things for like relationships and stuff. And it, it all comes from a place of like, I'm happy. I'm so happy, but it took so long to figure this stuff out. Like, God, if I'd only figured this out when I was younger. And so I try to share the things that I've learned along the way. Um, and I, you know, Hey, maybe this is, maybe this is most people like, you know, who knows anything when you're 20, like I thought I did, but I'm, I'm happier now than I've ever been. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I like sharing that. It makes me happy to share it. And, and then I got my group, like I, for example, on my, okay, Scott Stokely, 
.net forward slash discord on my discord server. Um, every two weeks, I do a live, a live stream with everybody on there where we talk about physical health um, and then we talk about mental health. We have, to, I have two different, you know, every two weeks, we just, we just get together and talk about depression or happiness. And it's just an open forum where we talk about these things because it helps people, you know, for sure. And I'll even go a step further. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but it helps men. You know, I, I don't know how much help I give to give to like, like I, I'm a man, I, I understand men and, and I think I can communicate with men. I communicate with everybody, but I think a lot of men go, Ooh, there's something there that maybe I'm not hearing other places because a lot of men don't talk about stuff. Oh yeah. We, we hate it. We hate, we hate, <laughs> we hate letting anyone know that things aren't going good in our life. That is for sure. We like to kind of bundle all that up. That's why to me, like Kelsey, my wife has been such a lifesaver because she is someone that I am not afraid to bring anything to, you know, whether, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just someone that I can actually bounce my feelings off of. And I, I completely agree with you. Like, I don't know what it is, but like growing up as guys, like we never really talked about that. Like everything always, if everyone, if anyone ever brought up something that was like deep, we would always make fun of them or like, <laughs> you know, do something to try to change the subject. Like we never wanted to talk about deep stuff, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I love it. I, I, well, I think I, we so eventually... I have this theory that for most guys and, and I'm, I'm totally generalizing here. So don't, don't, you know, clip this out and make it me sound different than I am. It's a generalization, but I think, I think a lot of men have, have the experience of opening up to their partners and having it used against them. And when other men open up to groups of men, we crap all over them and we make fun of them. Yeah. However, when a man opens up to one man, his friend, it's okay. Mm. Like when you're talking to your bro about depression or things that are going on in your life, one-on-one men communicate really well with each other. We just, it's it's just only that one-on-one thing that it, it seems to work. And so Getting past that is is the challenge because men are men are open. We talk to other men as long as there's only one of them. I think mm. maybe I don't know if you guys have had that experience, but that's what I've I've seen in my life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's not that many times too that you're just like solo with one dude too. Like I don't know, we kind of we kind of do a lot of things in packs, uh, right. or at least that's my experience, right? You know, yeah. but a lot you're of all, people you're... do have that do have that best friend that you're able to communicate with you know what i mean like that one person where you're like hey man i'm going through something like blah 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 you want to hear it out and and you're right there i feel like a one-on-one situation we are good communicators and we can we can hear that and be like hey man and give it to them straight too like hey man you're you're messing up bro you can't do that you know (laughs) um but if there is a group there then for sure, we make fun of them. <laughs> no, it's true. It is, no, yeah. and by the way, and you are right. And guys and guys do give it straight. Yeah. Like if, if 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 I if if I if I told my buddy one on one, I said, "Hey, man, I'm, I'm starting to put on weight. I don't look really good." They're not offering me sympathy. They're gonna be <laughs> no. like, "Get off your lazy ass and go to the gym, <laughs> dummy." Yeah. Like, like we don't beat around the bush with each other, no. but that's what that's what we need. But anyways. Um, what no, you, and, and by the way, Brody, you faced a ton of this when you came to the sport. I mean, there was so much stuff you had to, I mean, did it bother you when people, I mean, were you completely oblivious to the fact that people were rooting against you? Oh, no, or, I, mean, I, I definitely check comments and, you know, I'm pretty active on social media. So I see everything. It's, it's not my first rodeo though, which is, which is, uh, very helpful. Okay. Um, I've, I've actually, I've told, I probably have told this story once or twice before, but I've, you know, I have eight different YouTube channels or whatever. So one of the YouTube channels back in the day where I would just post like vlogs, essentially, um, I had a friend that was extremely, extremely talented guitarist and singer. And I was like, you need to like get your, this is back when like social media was just starting to kind of get traction. Mm -hmm. I was like, you need to like get your stuff out there. I was like, um, they sent me a video of them singing. I was like, I would love to post this on my YouTube channel so other people can see it. And maybe there's someone out there that would give you a platform or give you an opportunity to show your talents. Right. I post it. 
It gets a couple thousand views, which was really good for me in the first couple hours. Tons of positive comments. Tons of like, holy cow, this person's so good. And then all of a sudden, there was like one or two negative comments. And then I get a text, take it down. And I was like, what? Take it down. And I just, at a very early part of like my career in YouTube, I decided that I wasn't going to let a minority basically dictate my passion, dictate what I love to post, dictate what I'm doing. And it is a very difficult thing. Cause like in my head right there, I was like, you have 98 people saying you're incredible. And there's only two people saying that you're trash. Like, but if you're not put in that spot, I can see how that is like a very like, holy crap, I got to get out of here. So I feel like if I hadn't gone through what I did with YouTube, gone through what I did with Ultimate Frisbee, and I was just thrown in the spot like I was in disc golf, I think I would have handled it a lot differently. It would have gotten to me for sure. Um, but I've, I'm at the stage in my life now where it's like these guys, most of these people have no idea who I am. And if someone comes up to me and we have a conversation and at the end of their conversation, they're like, you suck. I don't like you. Then that is something that I would actually like look back on and be like, okay, what was it in that conversation that we had that I did wrong? What, how did I, how did I interact to have that person react that way? But if someone's just coming at me on social media and they've never met me, we've never interacted with me. We've never had a conversation and they say something nasty I don't really get too upset about it because they don't know who I am. Mm. Like, so they're not able to judge me appropriately because we've never actually had any sort of interaction and that's how I view it. And so I don't let it get under my skin and I just keep doing my thing. Well, people, yeah, people it, it, it is. So, I, I agree. It's a learned skill. Like I'm, I'm fine with it now, you know, but it's not like at the beginning, you know, like I, I, I almost, when I set my first world distance record, um, or no, the first time I saw a post about the fact that it was at altitude, right? It was at 5,000 feet. It's not, it's a reasonable elevation. But the first time someone commented about that, I was devastated. I couldn't believe that. I mean, I was crushed by this. Meanwhile, everybody in the sport celebrating this, this accomplishment and this one person that pointed out something that wasn't even inaccurate. I mean, they weren't even wrong. You know, I mean, but you can say the same thing with an extra three miles an hour win, right? It's a variable. But, uh, yeah, I remember being crushed. Where now it's like I, I wouldn't feel that way. <laughs> it would be like – but yeah, but but you have to learn it, though. And when you're 18 years old and you're brand new to the tour, I could see how it would be a little bit hard, especially yeah, when right. you're new. You, you got yeah. it, too, when you joined Jomez. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People didn't like me for sure right away. Um, but I don't know. I've been, when, when you grow up in sports – in general, I feel like that puts a little chip on your shoulder. If you're actually really competitive at other things, there's always people, always different competitors trying to shut you down. And I've, I've always had like thick, pretty thick skin with, with all that stuff. I just think how crazy it is that people want to see you fail. Like that's the one thing that kind of hurts me a lot of times is not like I could care less of what people think of, of you. But the people who actually want to see you fail, that's crazy to me. You know, like they want you to like not be successful for some reason and they don't even know you. I mean, shoot, last week I had so much hate come my way over something. And I remember sitting down with my wife and being like, this is crazy. I'm like, I've had a clean slate my whole career. I have a tiny little mess up where an unfortunate thing happened to me, I break my shoulder and people are coming after me for this and telling me that I'm a liar and that I did this and blah, 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 blah. And they're not even there. And then I'm, I, I go down the rabbit hole of reading yeah. some of the comments and people being like, known him my whole life. This is what he does. And I'm like, Holy cow, this is, this is insane. Um, but then it comes back to the, to the fact of when you're put in, we're lucky enough to be here. First of all, we're lucky enough to have the haters. The haters are good. They're, they make for interesting television, if anything. And I do feel sorry for this generation coming up into this because of how toxic it is. And if they don't have help or have good parents or have a good wife or somebody to 
to kind of navigate them through if they unfortunately do mess up one time, then that can be a really tough thing to go through a career with because it can be really lonely. Um, and so that's nice to hear Scott's story about how, you know, uh, the disc golf world saved him. And with the kids coming up with social media and everything, and, and maybe there's going to be things that people like, let's just say Joey buckets wins. And there's a comment that's like, well, yeah, Macbeth wasn't there. You know what I mean? Like those little things can hurt a little bit. This kid just won. Why would we ever shut something down like that? You know what I mean? Like eh, not a full field. Like it eh, was it a win. You know what I mean? Like those are real comments that people put out there and they believe them for some reason. How about we just like push our, our young generation up, you know what I mean? And, and celebrate. Well, and part of it though, and I, cause I've spent a lot of time. I, I, I I did take it upon myself in 2022. I probably took 40 of the touring players out to dinner, younger players, talking to them about branding, their careers, marketing, like, especially if I, if I didn't see them, if they were, if they weren't doing something well, um, business wise, cause I mean, I'm good at the business, just like, like, well, Brody, like, like I would say me and you have the most disproportionate incomes relative to our player rating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, no, it just means we're skilled at the business part. No, no, That's yeah, not yeah, a bad yeah. thing. It's, no, it's, it's, we have that, that is one of our skill sets that um, we utilize. So I talked to the kids about it. But one of the things that I've, I've always told them is that when you're a professional athlete, you are a public figure. Like, if you don't want to be a public figure and get those comments, well, then you can choose another field. But if you're going to be a public figure, that's just the way it works. Tom Brady got booed in, in Denver, and Peyton Manning got booed at Foxborough every single time. And for everything I can tell, they're both pretty nice guys. Um, it's just they're public figures, and it's just it's sports. So I, I, I accept that that's part of my, it's part of my job. It comes with, it's part of the responsibility of being a public figure is that some people aren't going to like me. I don't think it's hopefully not that many, but it's not zero for sure. What, what do you, what advice would you give to maybe some of the people on tour now that, you know, keep their social media, very PR, uh, their interviews are very just like bland. Like there are a lot of people on tour that you don't really get any sort of like after saying, after hearing that story, if no one knew who you were, or knew that story before, and you go out and you play, I bet you're going to have a lot of people rooting for you, right? Because you connected to them with that story. I think that's one of the biggest things lacking right now with disc golf is, yes, of course you have to have the skill that people are amazed by and want to see the skill of, holy cow, I can't believe they can throw that far, they can putt that good. But another aspect is like there is that personal element of like actually wanting to really root for someone and have that connection with the player. Mm -hmm. And when you when you just don't give anything in your interviews and when you're not really coming on podcasts and talking, when you're not doing anything to really form that, uh, it makes it makes the uh, I don't know, it makes the sport a little bit bland, in my opinion. So do you think players need to do that more often? For, for sure. So I, I've, I've learned most of my marketing from professional wrestling. There you I go. I'm an old school pro wrestling guy, but I look at pro wrestling as the most money made off a product that shouldn't be making anything through how they market and package their product. I think they're better at marketing than anyone in the world. Um, I mean, they're as big as professional sports and they're cosplaying, right? Yeah. Um, and that's respectful. I, I, I pro wrestle, so I respectfully say this, right? They're they're going through a lot, but the 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 way pro wrestling works is typically the most successful pro wrestlers at, at marketing themselves are pro wrestlers who play themselves with the volume turned up to eleven. Mm. Mm. So anytime you anytime some booker gives a pro wrestler tells them to play a character that's not them, in other words, they're completely fake. It, they suck at it. If you're not funny, don't make your character funny. But if you are a drunk redneck from Texas, go be Stone Cold Steve Austin. If you're an arrogant celebrity, go be The Rock. Uh, that work. Ric Flair is Ric Flair when the cameras aren't rolling. 
So I, I tell the players, it's basically the same thing. You don't have to go be the funniest person on social media if that's not your personality. Don't try to be the funny guy. But what is, what is it about you that that is you? Amplify and it. If it's, it doesn't matter what it is. Take that thing that's you and then turn the volume up. So for me, for example, I love teaching. I love teaching disc golf. So I lean into that as heavily as possible. I'm going to be the best disc golf teacher in the world. And I know I'm sitting here with someone else who's one of the best disc golf teachers in the world. So uh, I know you understand, but that is something that is, I've made part of my brand because it is who I am. I am a teacher at heart. If I wasn't a teacher at heart, I could not be a successful teacher. So I tell the players that too. If the thing you have going for you, 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 you don't like talking on camera, you don't feel like you're charismatic, you're, you're totally an introvert, but you throw the disc a mile, that's fine. But you need to make a ton of social media content if you throw in the disc a mile and lean into that because that is what you do. Um, and then that's good advice. Then, then they all have, they all, everybody's got something, but do your something loud. We need to see like an extra large Joey Buckets hat. Yeah. yeah. Like just, just a, gigantic just a ginormous bucket. bucket. bucket hat. Yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, look at Simon. Like when Simon does all these trick shots and he's basically, you know, has his childlike quality to them. We know that that is who Simon is. Simon couldn't pretend to be that. He never would have been as popular if that wasn't who he, he really kind of is. But he leaned into it and he built a brand around doing crazy shots and doing fun, silly stuff. And, and, um, and that's why it worked for him. Now, Paul Macbeth, Paul Macbeth, it doesn't have the same personality. Well, Paul Macbeth was the greatest player in the world. So Paul Macbeth leaned into the Paul Macbeth brand and the Paul Macbeth brand was this, this larger than life status. And, 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 but he, he turned the volume up on that. I really think that's what, that's what works. Yeah, there's there were some people that were getting very popular on YouTube, Vine, some of these other platforms. They would like make a video, for example, that was kind of out of character for them. And it got mm -hmm. really it got a lot of views or it got a lot of attention. And so then they would make another video like that. And they could make another video. And then all of a sudden, like when they try to make the videos that they used to make or that they want to make all their fans are like, no, 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 we want this. And so now all of a sudden, like you were saying, like, if you don't love that, if you don't love what you're doing there, or you're doing something that's completely not you, you're kind of like stuck in this bubble of where mm -hmm. now you just have to create, be this character that isn't even who you are. And you're like locked in there. And so like, I, that was, that was always my advice to people of when they're like, Hey, I want to get into social media. What should I do? It's like, find what you love and you're passionate about and do that. Because if you start doing other stuff, that's going to, cause like, that's the thing is as much as people want to come after this podcast, which people have in the past, there are certain things that me and Yuli do not care about. We do not really care about these silly stories off off the course relationships gossip all we don't really care about any of that stuff so we don't really talk about it but mm -hmm. you know what gets a lot of views that stuff like look at one of our most popular views ever it was yuli having to defend himself of his story of in europe like that that stuff gets views we could easily talk about natalie ryan every week and post out stuff that's going to get views but we hate that. And so like to me tonight, knowing that you're on the podcast, knowing that Joey Buckets is on the podcast, like I was excited to sit down and talk to you guys. And so like, that's my biggest advice to everyone is literally do what you love and do what you're passionate. And I think what you said is perfect. If you throw the disc really far and you suck at talking, don't talk, <laughs> just throw the disc really yeah. far and find cool things. Get a, get yes. a freaking, um, Get, a, get one of those flower, like the, the gallon flower bags and hang it up and be like, and chuck the disc and blow that flower bag up in slow mo. Yes, exactly. And then just look at the camera and put your shades on and walk off. Like, <laughs> don't talk. You suck at talking. That's fine. Like, yeah, I mean, 100%. I, yeah, I, think, I think, I think you can do it. I think it, my advice is uh, something that I kind of live by. And if you uh -huh. start something, then do it a hundred percent and don't stop. Don't stop. Don't quit. 
because it's the people who do it a little bit and they're like, okay, I could, I, this looks glorious. It looks like it's easy, but listen, coming in and doing this podcast every Tuesday, sometimes Brody and I don't want to do it. Wow. You know, I mean, come on now. I love talking about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the, the day before, like he just said, I was just on a podcast earlier. Some days you're going to be a little tired. Oh yeah. Do, for it, sure. every, do it every single time. And don't All right, stop. So, it, so to, to just let me touch on that for one second. If either of you ever gets tired of doing this and you want a new co-host, oh, I will throw my hat into the ring. <laughs> I would absolutely hey, I love, love to be a, or even be a guest co-host if, if, if you of ever course. need a week off. Um, so I, I want to push back a little bit on what you said, though, because I, I agree about doing what I mean, everything, mostly what you're saying. But I do think you do also have to listen to your audience a little bit. Um, you, you, oh, for if sure. you're not paying attention to what, you know, what they want and what they don't want. So when I, when I came back to the sport in 2014, I was like, well, I'm going to go do clinics because I'd already done 220 clinics all over the U S and I have all these world records. And I was really good back 20 or 15 years ago. And I would post about my clinics in these towns I was going to, and six people would show up because nobody remembered who I was. <laughs> Apparently people grow old and stop playing. Um, and all the new players, like I wasn't making money. So I said, I need to put attention on myself somehow. This is like 2015. I got to bring attention to myself, but I'm, I'm like probably 970 rated. I'm not going to be setting any world records. I'm like, how do I stand out? And I said, I know I'm going to be the most outrageous person in disc golf. Now I never did anything malicious. I never, I said, I never said a mean word to anybody, but I was doing stuff to be controversial. Again, not maliciously, but I would just be ridiculous. And I started getting a lot of attention and a lot of people followed me. None of those people were customers. I didn't make a dime doing any of that. So I was building an audience of people, but I wasn't building the type of audience that I wanted. They, mm. I, they weren't the type of audience that were going to follow me and, and support my disc golf projects. They wouldn't have bought my discs. They like laughing at my silly YouTube videos. So... I took time. I actually backed off from the sport for two more years, saw my daughter off to college. And then when I came back, I'm like, I just completely distanced myself from all of that. Doesn't mean I'm not, doesn't mean I was fake and it doesn't mean I'm not silly and goofy now, but I said, I'm going to lean into being the best professional disc golf teacher. I said, that's where I'm going to, I'm going to lean. And then when I pushed that out there and it started working, I went, okay, now I'm onto something. So there was some, there was some uh, modification in my plans, business plans, based on the free, you know, the free market folks with their wallet. And and it wasn't, I had a lot of fun, didn't make any money being crazy guy. Yeah. So <laughs> my it, point, it, it, didn't, it didn't work. Yeah. My point was more towards the, um, and again, everyone's driven differently, right? Like, um, is my mindset a little bit different now because I'm in a, a, a very financial stable position probably i'm sure that has a little bit of a point but i've i've never been super driven by trying to make more and more money um if you go and you kind of look at my uh career points and and what i've i've changed and shifted none of it was ever for money if anything a lot of the times i would change and shift I would go into something that I was going to make considerably less money. I mean, heck, if anyone knows what good, good is bro five was good, good before good, good existed, which is like now one of the top golf brands in the world. I could have continued on with that, but I did not like the way it was headed. And I didn't want to be a part of that anymore. Now, if money was everything and that's all I cared about, I could have easily been like, well, I can let this slide and I can let that slide and I won't, uh, who cares about, I'll turn a blind eye to that going on over there because I'm going to get a fat paycheck. But to me, at the end of the day, it's like, we only really have one life on this planet. You might as well be doing it something that you love doing. And I would much rather be making a couple bucks doing something I absolutely love doing than making a crap ton of money and being like miserable and not oh. wanting to wake up and have to go do it, you know? For sure, but I think you misunderstand what I was saying. I think we I agree, I think we both I didn't agree. reinvent my brand to make more money, I reinvented my brand to make any money. No, no, I, I, I think we both, I, be, I think we're both agreeing 
and uh, just a different way. But yeah, no, yeah. I, I you were you were basically saying like, hey, I'm down to try to figure out what to do to make money and you were just, yeah yeah you were just kind of dipping your toes but you never went a path of where you're like oh wow now i every single time i have to start a youtube video i have to go hey guys scott stoke like you you didn't you weren't putting on some weird thing of where people would meet you in person and be like dude what the heck like who who are you like this is not who you were so no. that's all i'm saying is a lot of people i think put this persona persona on or change who they are as a person and then all of a sudden they get stuck because that that's what brings them money. And if you're like an actor, I mean, sure, whatever. But a lot of times people, you know, people, no, act no, people, you know, you're right. People, people connect. They definitely connect to who they are. Yeah. So I don't know. This was, this was been a great interview though. Yuli, this is absolutely, this was phenomenal. Um, I guess, uh, well, do you have any new pet peeves? I guess it's been a while. Anything, um, anything popping off? No, so I, I actually got here. I'm going to announce it. I'll announce something here. This is just an idea I had. So one of the pet peeves I always have is um, I don't like when I walk out the front door of my hotel and I have to walk through a cloud of cigarette smoke. Ooh. Now, before you think I'm being judgy, because <laughs> I've openly talked about doing far worse than that in my life, um, <laughs> I used to smoke cigarettes up until uh, twenty, about 24 years ago. Um, you know, and, and actually, quitting cigarettes was harder than quitting any other drug. That was the hardest drug to quit. Wow, hands down. Um, how'd you How'd you do it? Did you do like pa a patch or gum? I did. Or so anything? what I did is I did I did the patches. Um, I would never have been able to do it without the patches. I, I, I tried before. It never worked. I did the patches, which gave me enough to barely make it through the day. And then you, you taper off. So um, what is a patch? Is the patch literally just giving you nicotine through your skin? Yeah. You get either, basically you get the nicotine of either, it's like seven, 14 or 21 milligrams, which is like seven, 14 or 21 cigarettes. So like a, a full patch is like a pack a day. Oh, so you get the, the same amount of, of drug that you would get off a pack of cigarettes that day, but it, it's steady throughout the day. You, what you don't get is the habit of, of the, of the action of smoking. You're doing it. Okay. Um, okay. So let me, I'll, I'll wait back up. So the, the, the thing about smoking is, is people who smoke and myself included when I smoked, there's an illusion that cigarettes make you feel good. And they, they don't make you feel good. What happens is, is that when, when you're withdrawing from cigarettes, your brain starts, uh, stops releasing dopamine and, and um, um, uh, norepinephrine and, and what, like, it, basically your brain is chemical deficit. So when you smoke, you get to baseline. Mm. So basically, if you were a smoker, Brody, when you are jonesing for a cigarette and have a cigarette, you don't feel good. You feel the way you do right this minute. It just takes, you just stop feeling bad. Um, so the nicotine patch basically takes that edge away from you. So you never have that, oh my God, I feel awful. Mm. That's what the patches do. So I just announced like literally two hours ago on my Facebook page on August 29th this year to celebrate my birthday. I thought, hey, how about if all my smoking friends out there, how about if we do a big international smoke out? And if you want to quit smoking, let's all quit smoking. Now, I don't smoke anymore, but I, you know, I said all my smoke, let's all quit smoking on August 29th. And uh, we'll root each other on and hold each other accountable. And, and my idea was, is that if we do this, some of the people, like whatever you quit, it, it works for some people and doesn't for others, but it won't be zero. So, uh, my pet peeve of being annoyed by smokers, uh, I was reminded of that this morning when I walked out of my hotel into a cloud of smoke, and that's where I got the idea of, of doing a smoke out on August 29th of this year. So if you go to my Facebook page, I'm going to start posting all about how, uh, and by the way, I'm not telling anybody what to do, so I'm not telling you, you need to quit smoking. If you want to smoke, smoke. But if you want to quit August 29th on my birthday, we're going to do a big smoke out. We're going to root each other on and, and um, see if, if some of us can, can break the habit. Love that. Can I tell you why I don't like smokers? Why? Because when we go play bingo, there is a, there's a room for the smokers that's like separate. 
they always freaking win. They always freak. <laughs> it's always someone in smoking because we have we play on these like little iPads, so you can play with like a hundred cards, right? And you just have right. a ton of cards going. And when you're one away, it makes a little noise. So then everyone's like, and you're looking to see who's one away, and you're watching them to see. You never hear the ding in the smoker, so you think no one's close. And then all of a sudden, uh, we have a winner in smoking, and you're like, so that's my that's my pet hey, peeve against I, smokers. I'm at an age that you you if you if you aren't aware of this, this is going to crack you up uh, because this was something when I was younger. But they used to have a smoking section on airplanes. So oh. like the back the back five rows were where the smokers where you were allowed to smoke. But back in the seventies, probably sixty percent of people smoked. So sixty percent of the people on the plane throughout the flight would wind up in the back five rows, huddled together smoking at the back of a, of a commercial like, airliner. Did they have it like blocked off? No. No, they so, just had a vent. Did I was gonna say, do people not know how smoke dissipates through the air, or they they're just assuming all of it went in the vent? <laughs> no, no. I mean, they just they, there was a vent, but but look, when every when sixty percent of people smoke and sixty percent of people have clothing that smells like they've been smoking, oh. you don't really notice the smell of smoke because the airplane smells like an ashtray, but. It doesn't even smell like an ashtray. It smells like an airplane because all airplanes smell like. That. Yeah. Wait. So yeah, it's, people it's, just had like changed. people just had like lighters on a plane. Uh, back then, yeah. Jeez, jeez. There wasn't. There wasn't even security back then. You would just walk <laughs> onto a plane. <laughs> you just no, I'm up. not kidding. You just walk just, straight you on. You, you go on a take. Hey, can I tell you just a, com- a complete yeah, aside yeah, go, story? Go for you it. You want to hear just a bizarre story, not related to anything except uh, <laughs> except airlines. So I'm adopted, and I've known in my whole life that I was adopted. And a couple of years ago, I did the 23 and Me thing, um, where I and then it turns out I found a brother that I never knew I had, who I've now met a couple times and spent time with, and and you know, so it was really neat. But usually, when people find their birth family records um it's usually like oh yeah my family lived on a farm in iowa for four generations and and like that's it right well my birth dad is my dad and my grandpa Grandpa. my grandpa my birth grandpa spent one and a half years in the federal penitentiary for a seven million dollar fraudulent airline ticket scam which is like 25 million dollars so, so apparently my grandpa was printing fake airline tickets and selling them all <laughs> over the country and went to the penitentiary. And I'm like, that is such a way cooler story than like my grandpa had a farm in Iowa. Oh, cause you could, cause back then you would just like flash your ticket. There was no yeah, scanning. It, was ticket. It, just, it was printed. There was no internet or anything. But look, back then when you, when you bought a plane ticket, the credit card, it wasn't connected to a bank. You took a credit card. You put on a piece of thing with a carbon paper underneath. You slid this thing over the card, which imprinted the card on the piece of paper. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. Every day the airline company would mail a stack of these to like American Express, who would then itemize them and send them to banks. And like four weeks later, they'd get their money for them. I mean, that's the way the world works. So, yeah. So the idea of having a, an airline ticket that just had your name printed on it was not, I mean, it, it clearly was working. They, they got busted for like $7 million worth of them. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That is crazy. No, I, by the way, it's probably the strangest topic ever talked about on the on the Tour Life podcast. But No, I love I love a good scandal. There was someone in um, John Rahm's neighborhood that just got swatted a massive – uh, a massive scam. I think it was some sort of like cell phone scam of where it was like in the billions of dollars that they were like scamming people out of money. And uh, yeah, there was like some raid that went down in his house in this like beautiful neighborhood of where everyone just thought this guy was a well, well off dude. And it turned out he was just a huge con artist for years. And he finally got caught. It's I love myself a good con, con artist story. I love it. That's crazy. It, you, it, you got a good story that are definitely. I mean, a, a person that tries to steal the Mona Lisa is a far more interesting story than a, a person who holds up a 7-Eleven. <laughs> I also have my Twitter hacked. I would love to talk to whoever hacked my Twitter. I think that would be a great interview on the podcast, too. 
<laughs> try so to open, sell. So open invite to the Twitter hack. Yeah, try. Please so I, let me know way, how I'm many serious, guys. If you ever want a day off and want to co-host, I would absolutely. Well, Yuli's be, about to be a dad, so there's a good chance that Yuli might. Good chance. There's a good week. chance that Yuli next week might be out. So if you want to jump on the world's preview, uh, you might be a great person to have on it because I think we're probably going to try. Uh, I'll probably be in. Well, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be in. Um, Silas, we'll probably be set up at the new place, right? For the pod. Yeah, so we'll probably have some guests come on and having you as a co-host would be awesome. I, hey, I, I would if love you that. Can, I, if you I've can't always do it. gotten along great with you, Brody. It yeah. was funny because before we ever met, the internet decided we were mortal enemies. <laughs> no, you know, they need a good story. They need a good rival story. But it was a good story. And you know, I don't, to me, if that made people tune in and watch, fantastic. Yeah. Of course. So I, I thought it was I thought it was a great story. It was really fun, and I think that, that the sport. I think more of that would be better than less. Yeah. No. If people definitely like kind of uh, went in a little bit in on it as well. All right, Yuli, <laughs> you hit him with the last question. Out of the guys on tour right now, who do you look at? Is there anybody new that you look at their game and you're like, I want that. That's really nice. Oh God. Oh my God. It's so God. I, I, I don't want to just give a soft answer and say like every single 15 year old on tour is good, <laughs> except they all are. Um, I think that, and this is okay. This is not, this is a, a top 20 player, but I think Cole Redolin, uh is one of the players that could be a number one player in the world. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, and, and uh, again, okay, I've been super impressed with Emily Weatherman, um, yeah. but I'm, I'm going to go with Ellie Ezra. Ooh. Okay. And that's not me being politically correct because it's FPO. Um, yeah. I think Ellie Ezra has the chance, the potential to change the game. Mm. And, and I would say out of MPO and FPO, I would say Ellie's the only person that I, I could see literally changing the game. Like I look at Ellie Ezra as the first figure skater to do a triple. And then looks at the world and says, if you don't do triples, I win. Mm. And I think, I think that can happen. Now, unfortunately for Ellie, there's so many talented players out there. They're going to learn how to do triples and they're going to, they're going to keep up. But I, I, I think that Elias was probably the most exciting, like person, you know, I, I think she could win a tournament and then, and then just keep winning. Fascinating. Great yeah. answer. Yeah, no, watching her throw, it definitely uh Looks she different. definitely she definitely stands, yeah, she definitely stands out uh compared to a lot of other people. And so it'll be it'll be fascinating to see ten years from now, you know, like we were talking about the forehand. No one was throwing the forehand. Now you look at tour, like pretty much everyone has a three hundred and fifty foot forehand. A lot of people have a four hundred plus forehand. Like, are we gonna see that in FPO ten years from now? Are we just gonna see like every girl look like they're throwing hard you know yes. yeah i think you absolutely will and it's, it's such a weird thing because the biology doesn't change like that's not how evolution works it doesn't change one generation to the next and i think the technique and in, in the fpo is is very very good but there's something about somebody doing something yep. that just makes everyone else go oh i can't do that and once they realize they can do it there's everyone's ceiling gets higher yeah. I, I, yeah, I think Elias the... is going to bring the entire field up behind her. Um, I also really like her as a person. I've gotten to know her and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, every time I see it, I'm like, you know, I'm your biggest fan. Cause I kind of am. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Ellie and, and, you know, and then God, there's an F and MPO who knows just, they're all great. Well, wasn't it like the, uh, the four minute mile, like no one could break the four minute mile. And as soon as the first person broke the four minute mile, like within the next year or two, tons of people were just breaking it because all of a sudden, like you said, someone had to do it first. And then it puts that thought in their idea of like, Oh, this is actually possible. And so, well, I mean, and I, I, that's why I use the example of the triple because once someone did a triple, everyone started doing triples. It, it wasn't like they weren't physically able to before. They didn't get stronger in over the course of the next year. Just someone did it, and they're like, oh, okay, I guess I can do that. And all of a sudden, they can. I mean, yeah. one of the biggest things you can see that it is like motocross or BMXing oh, or the skateboarding. backflips? 
like a backflip ha- yeah. back happened and now it's like how about we do seven of them yeah. <laughs> like we could do Crazy. seven yeah you remember tony hawk did the 900 like i remember yeah. watching that and being like that is insane and now people are basically doing tricks on top of the 900 like well, they, they just had that kid who was like what was he six years old or nine years old or something just do a 900 he just landed 900 yeah it's just it's 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 crazy it is it is definitely crazy yeah you you do have to say though there is some evolution happening though because like Wimby did not exist twenty years ago. There wasn't a Wimby. Oh Wimby, okay, yeah, no. That, Sorry, basketball. That... Victor Wimbanyama, like that that yeah, yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. That person did not like he's the first of his kind. So there is a little evolution that is happening. Ha- has to be. Could you imagine yeah. Wimby back like thirty years ago playing in the NBA? Chase. No, no, that yeah, he's he's gonna be shooting old. threes. Yeah, just <laughs> seven yeah, no, yeah, right. pulling seven up shooting threes. Yeah, you just be like, this is be impossible. Hilarious. Oh man. So, <laughs> all right, Scott. Well, we appreciate the time, man, Loved and uh, we'll stay in touch and let you know about next week because I think that would be great to have you at least have you on uh, leading into Worlds. Um, but yeah, we appreciate the openness. We appreciate the stories. You're always welcome back on here, and uh, we wish you the best uh, moving forward. Can I can I throw yeah. in a plug? Oh, because yes, plug everything right here. Yes, I yes. Never, plug it up. I would I would chastise any of the touring players for not plugging their stuff. Plug plug away. Um, so I'm manufacturing Stokely discs. Um, you know, tour quality golf discs at stokelydiscs.com. And I also purchased chain discs and I, and I, I brought the Stokely disc, but you all have seen competitive golf discs. The chain disc is the, the uh, first one is the Juju with the thumb, uh, thumb grooves on top. Um, you can check those out at uh, stokelydiscs.net. Uh, the biggest thing that I'm doing with my company is I am adamant about, we need pro shops. We need pro shops and vendors to stay in business. They are paramount to the growth of the sport. And to for this to happen, I think the culture of the sport needs to change. And I think people need to understand that when they shop local and they shop from their local pro shop or vendor or even club, they're not doing it to be nice. It's not altruism. Uh, the reason you buy discs at your local pro shop and vendor is because these are the people that are running tournaments. These are the people that are putting courses in the ground. They're running leagues. They're teaching classes. They're going to schools and growing the sport locally. So these are the people that are making the sport good for you in your hometown. So if you are buying discs, like, so for example, if you're in a town where they sell Stokely discs, don't buy from my website. Like, I'll make this sale when I sell to the store. If you want to support me, buy my disc, but buy them from the local store because if you keep that person in business, they will make the sport better for you in your town. And that's the biggest, the biggest thing I'm trying to push is support local vendors and local retailers because, uh, look, every manufacturer in the sport, end of a down to disc crafting, I mean, they've, they've all done so many great things to grow the sport. I'm not taking away from anything any of these manufacturers have done. They've donated millions of dollars and we wouldn't be where we were without them. But in your town, no manufacturer does as much for the sport in your town as your local pro shop vendor or club is doing. So support those local businesses in your town uh it's in your best interest and then ultimately it's in the best interest of disc golf because they're growing the sport locally which is what's growing the sport globally so support local that's my that's my plug uh, i'm gonna plug the pro shops not my discs heck yeah love <laughs> that it. juju man my dad and i that was like my third putter that i ever got and we me and my dad were convinced it was better in the wind because it had the dimples like a golf ball. Right. We were convinced. <laughs> like I made my first ever probably 45 footer with, with that disc in the wind. And I, that's all I'd use in the wind. Do you know what it was well, called? Let me make a pitch about this disc. So it's hard <laughs> to see right here. Do you know but what there's... it was called before the juju? Before it was called the juju. It was called the, um, the, the mojo. The mojo but someone yes. the name mojo. <laughs> yeah. So there's nine different thumb divots on the top, but the five of them are five different distances from the rim, which is you could choose where your thumb goes, how far from the rim. Uh, 
from everything I can tell, and I've thrown Ching Disc, well, I own the company now, I own all eight original molds. Not all of them have like thumb grooves. I don't believe these affect the flight. What the thumb grooves do is with every other golf disc made, you got tons of stuff to hang on to on the bottom of the disc. But the top of the disc, you're always required to use friction and friction alone with your thumb to the disc. The thumb grooves add a little bit of a ridge to allow you to grip the disc a little easier. And the, the biggest challenge for me with Ching discs, and uh, thank you for the plug, Yuli, by the way, on this disc, the biggest challenge is there's been a lot of really interesting, innovative ideas in disc golf, and honestly, most of them are, are gimmicks. I mean, hats off to trying new creative ideas, but most of them, are, they, they didn't work and they're silly. This is not a gimmick. This is a great way to hold the disc with a consistent thumb placement. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, on a campaign to con- you know, convince everybody. And it's that really good fly, in the wind. They I'll, fly I'll great. For you. They fly good in the wind. I, I bag it. I bag it. And, and you... it's a great disc, but it's not a gimmick. They, the, the thumb grooves, it's called accelerator contours, are, are, uh, they work. They're, they're great. So Have anyways, you been able to test that as far as, like, are, are you getting more speed or do you think you're getting more uh, revolutions with the thumb grooves? No, I don't, think I'm, I don't think it's for me. I don't believe it's either. So when these first came out, uh, a lot of people, there was a pitch that where you put your thumb would affect the nose angle on the disc and affected the flight. Um, I'm always honest with everybody. I would love to pitch that. I, I, I haven't observed that. Um, here's what I've observed is that when I throw this disc with my thumb in the five different spots, I get more wobble with my thumb in certain spots than others, which tells me there's a specific place my thumb should go. And I think most of us realize this because most of us place our thumb in a, a certain spot every time we throw our putter or our, you know, our drivers. Um, but this actually, you know, basically quantifies exactly where that spot is. So I know which spot to put my thumb to get the cleanest release. But in the middle of the summer when it's hot and my hands are sweaty, this just allows me to grip the disc. Mm. And then the flight of the disc is that, Brody, you would love this disc. I know it's, it, I know you have <laughs> obligations to a company, but this disc flies a little bit like an Ultrastar. You know, an Ultrastar has a very slow turn. Like it flies basically, Ultrastar basically flies straight but they will turn slowly, but they never really fade, which, which no golf disc does that. And that's basically what this does. It, it has a very slow turn, so it's flying straight, really gradual, but it doesn't dump off at the end, which means it does something that other discs don't do. Again, it's, it's, I mean, it's not I a love, gimmick. It, I love it's a myself a no-fade disc. I'm not going to lie. I love myself a no-fade disc. The Sky Streak is kind of like that. They just lost the mold, so... Yeah, I mean, all frisbees were, and by the way, and the glitch, we we add the glitch to that category. Mm. You know, glitch doesn't fade. Glitch, just glitch does something. No golf disc flies like a glitch, but mm. glitches are smaller and lighter. This is actually you can throw this at a golf weight. So fascinating. All right. Well, thank Thanks, you man. so much, Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you, and we'll stay in touch uh, about next week, brother. Yeah, I would, I would love that. I'm going to be uh, – I do a full-day seminar in Columbus tomorrow, and then I'm heading straight to Virginia to get ready for Worlds. So oh, and you'll I'll, be I'll there, you there too in person. All right, perfect. So we might we might actually just have you in the studio as well. That's awesome. Hey, you guys, it's always an honor. Congratulations on your continued success with the show. Um, you guys are both my friends. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, appreciate Scott. it, brother.